Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Uh, cast your vote for the show on Podcast Alley, podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. And join our 400 uh, fans on Facebook, facebook.greatdetectives.net. Before we get started, I do want to let you know a, a little bit about the Roku. I requested the Roku as a Christmas present so that I could uh, better enjoy the Netflix streaming videos through my wireless connection. Well, since I've gotten the Roku, it's gotten even better with a wide variety of different channels that you can try out for free. There's the Newscaster uh, channel. Uh, also, one of my favorites, of course, is the Blueberry channel and the Mediafly channel where you can listen to this podcast as well as the Old Tom Dragnet show and the Old Time Radio Daily Westerns. Uh, so you can make your television into a radio. There's also a lot of great channels with pictures, videos, and music. The Roku has never been a better deal. Available now, starting at just around $60. Go to greatdetectives.net and click on the Roku banner. Well, um, for our 250th episode special, I'm bringing you something I think is... Uh, truly special. It's a San Francisco final. I heard this show um, several months back and the moment I heard it I, I thought to myself I've got to bring this to the audience as a special. I think they'll really enjoy it. I, I know many of you started listening to the great detectives through the old time Dragnet uh, podcast. This uh, particular show has a lot in common uh, with uh, Dragnet in terms of uh, its tone. Uh, the star of the show is Jeff Chandler. And those of you who are detective fans will remember Jeff Chandler uh, from his role as Michael Shane in the uh, widely syndicated New Adventures of Michael Shane. This is kind of a dragnet for newspapers. It's a very unique, well-done series. Incredible uh, cast and writing, uh, music, just a wonderful production all around. Uh, the show is dated from 1954, uh, and I listened to Jim Widner, and Widner says that uh, it never actually made it to air. And the only reason I can think of that it didn't, the big reason, was that it was July of 1954. It was hard for anything to make it uh, in radio. Television had passed radio in profitability three years before. But this is an incredible story, an incredible show. So let's go ahead and take a listen to Jeff Chandler in San Francisco Final. Ladies and gentlemen, this is San Francisco Final. This is the story of a newspaper. This is the story of the daily record of a city, of people and events, and a search for truth. From the pages of the San Francisco Chronicle, a true story reported by Mike Rivera. It has a latitude and a longitude, but the names can tell you better. The Gulf of the Farallons washes against it westerly, and north there's a Golden Gate. East, too, there's ocean water, called a bay now, so that San Francisco itself is the tip of a peninsula. And there's a part of it that centers on Grant Avenue and houses the largest Chinese community outside of China. City within a city. Not very many months ago, a story started here. A story that exploded all over the world. The fog tumbles over Twin Peaks from the ocean before it rolls up Mission Street. When it touches fifth, any Chronicle reporter working cityside can look out of the window and see the edge of town turn gray. The way it did early Wednesday afternoon when I was working rewrite. I had on the headphones and was taking notes. Hank Peters on the Chronicle police beat was calling from the press room at the Hall of Justice. They brought in this fellow, this Chinese fellow, ten minutes ago. He beat up on his own brother. Hurt bad? He's in emergency hospital right now, unconscious. Doc Bauer says he's in pretty bad shape. Possible skull fracture. Mm. Definite concussion. What were they fighting about? I don't know. All I checked out so far is they got in a fight in the corner of Waverly and Washington. 
The boy knocked his brother down. The brother cracked his head against a fire hydrant. Okay, well, wait a minute. Yeah, I got it. How about some names? The uh, boy in jail is Johnny Shen. That's S-H-E-N. Mm-hmm. 23 years old. Brother's name is Lee. Doc says maybe a year or two younger. That's about it. Chinese fighting in public. Never knew that to happen before. Me neither, Mike, in 20 years. They always keep their trouble to themselves. Yeah. You got an address? Yeah, both boys live at 6012 Clay. 6012. Thanks, Hank. Right. Selma, give me the clips on a John Shen or Lee. Yes, What'd you want, Mike? Clips on John Shen or Lee Shen. S H E N, if you have any. You're out. John Shen? And Lee. Well, I got one for both brothers. Same story, Mike. One clip for each. Well, let's take a look. Sign me out for these, will you? Yeah, sure. Gabe, I might want to go five takes on What do you think? Yeah, sure. It'll go a column, Mike. Yeah, anyway, I'll see how it goes. Hi, Mike. Hi. Right. You got a minute, Abe? Yeah, sure. What Hank just gave me. Maybe I better read you something first. Okay. Dated March 3, 1953. The head reads, Brother saves brother in Chinatown fire. Early this morning, John Shen saved his brother from suffocation when a two-alarm fire raged in a tenement at 6012 Clay Street. Shen, age 22. City desk, Melancott. Run it down for me, Charlie. Sausalito? Okay. Benet, 430 for the first. Johnny Shen, age 22. Shen braved the smoke to enter the back room of the third floor and carried his brother Lee to safety. Lee, two years younger than his brother, had been overcome by the smoke, but was recovering at Chinese hospital. The cause of the fire was undetermined. Saved his brother's life, Ed. Well... A little while ago, he almost killed him in a fist fight in a sidewalk down in Chinatown. What'd they fight about? Hank said he didn't know. You know, when I covered stories in Chinatown, I never knew him to bring trouble out where people could watch. Yeah, that's the point I want to make. Good point. I'll go talk to Johnny. All right. Can Art handle those two stories I have hanging Lee right? Yeah. You say Johnny almost killed his brother? That's right. When you write it, try a new approach on it. It's been covered before. What do you mean? Genesis chapter 4, verse 8. Cain and Abel. I took the elevator down to the street floor, stopped at the cigarette stand in the lobby, then walked out into the fog. I grabbed a cab and took the ten-minute ride up Stockton Street to Washington and down to Kearney to the Hall of Justice. At the end of the second-floor corridor is a room marked Chinatown detail. I went in. Sergeant Lou Morrissey was at his desk. I told him I wanted to talk to the Shen boy. Calvi will bring him right down. Thanks. You hear anything more on his brother? Doc says critical. Why'd they fight? Who knows? Did you talk to him? I brought him in. He hasn't done anything but sneer since I picked him up. She got any record? Uh-uh. No, he's got a job. His boss says he's a fine boy. I'll show you something, though. Here. Here's the sheet on him. Look. Right here. Two thousand dollars. Mm-hmm. Two $1,000 bills. I didn't find them when I shook them down. They were taped to his body when they took him to the shower room. Where'd he get all that money? Bank of America in Chinatown. Did he tell you he did? After a while, yeah. After we told him we'd throw a robbery charge at him on top of everything else. He said Bank of America and which branch? It checked out. John and Lee Shen, joint account. Up to last Monday, $2,016.23. Now, $16.23. Ask him about it and you get a stare. Just... Oh, thanks, McKelvey. Sit down, Johnny, over there. Mr. Rivera here is a reporter from the Chronicle. Hello, Johnny. How, how do you feel? Look, downstairs I told him that... Look, I've got nothing to say to you. Don't have to tell you a thing. That's right. So tell us, Sergeant, we're all finished. Well, just one thing. I read something about you before I came up here. What? About the fire, how you saved your brother's life. It's a brave thing to do. You think so? No, on account of you, he might die. You're in a lot of trouble, Johnny. Go write about it. All right, what do you want me to say? What are you talking about? All right, two ways I can write it. I can say you're a thief, you were taking off with your brother's money. 
What other way would you write about it? I could start from the beginning. Like what? Your story and your brother's. You, you live on Clay Street, don't you? Yeah. How long have you lived there? As long as we've lived in San Francisco. How long is that? 22 years. I was born in Beiping, China. I came here when I was a year old. And your brother was born in this country? Uh-huh. It's a wild guess, Johnny. This fight, this hassle you had with Lee. Anything political about it? Political? Yeah, you know, Red China, National... No. China. Where'd you go to school? Chinatown. Long Q school? Lee did, not me. Just plain public school. Tell me about the two $1,000 bills. I drew them out of the bank. Why $1,000 bills? Easy to carry, not bulky. Look. Yeah? Get me out of here. I want to go back to my cell. Okay, Johnny, let's go. Why all of a sudden, Johnny? We're getting along fine. Get me out of here, Sergeant. Well, wait a minute. Maybe I can help. Maybe... Johnny, if your brother dies, you might be charged with murder. I want to go back to my cell. Mike, now you just want me to write it any way I want to. Is that right, Johnny? Any way you want to. Kill me. Take him upstairs. Well, not much of a story, huh, Mike? Grief's always a story. Thanks a lot, Lou. This is Mike. Give me the city desk, will you? Abe, Mike, on that Chinese story. Johnny Shen had two $1,000 bills taped to his body. No, that's right. When they stripped him for a shower. No, no, Johnny drew it out of a joint bank account they had. I don't know, maybe... Well, hold on a minute, will you? Yeah, Lou? Lucky you didn't call from outside or I'd have missed you. Well, what's up? Just had a call from emergency hospital. Lee Shen's dead. Not murder, huh? Mm Mm-mm. Not suicide. He told me Lee Shen had leaped from his hospital room window and killed himself. I gave it to Art Hoppy on rewrite. I told him I was going to check out the boy's family. It was a short walk from the Hall of Justice to the tenement at 6012 Clay Street. The Shen apartment was on the third floor, second door of a corridor where last year's fire had been charred into its walls and still showed. Yes? I'm Mike Rivera from the Chronicle. Yes? This is where Johnny and Lee Shen... Yes. I'd like to talk with you about them. Come in, please. This is my mother, Mr. Rivera. Good evening. Oh, uh, what's in tongue? My mother speaks only Chinese. I see. Uh, Miss Shen, I... Hi. bingo. One month here. San Man Fong si um ji one month. Ah, My mother wants to know what you want. Your being here disturbs her. Earlier there were police. I want to talk to you about your brothers. I'd like to know what... She wants to know about the $2,000. If you have it, she wants you to give it to us. I told you as a newspaper man, the police have... Mama, John King, police. So like... What's the trouble? Nothing. But you... I said nothing. Well, your mother's upset about the money and... Well? I don't know exactly. I'm thinking out loud. If she knows about the money, she knows Johnny drew it out of the bank and... And that now the police have it. We're not wealthy. My mother's concerned about $2,000, that's all. At a time like this? What do you mean? Your brother... They won't do anything to Johnny. It was an accident. I'm talking about Lee. Oh, he'll be all right. Don't you know? We were at the hospital about an hour ago. We looked in his ward and saw him. The doctor said he'd be all right. What was that about? Between my mother and me, Mr. Rivera, it doesn't concern you. Listen, Lee is dead. What? Just a half hour ago, Miss Jenny jumped out of the window. Ah, oh, Mama. Yeah. Ali. See Allah. law. See man. See a law. Yeah. 
Miss Chen, tell me something. What? Why did he kill himself? Out of shame? No, I don't understand. Is that what you do, explore the people's shame? All right, yes, it is. So like the pong pong go. Mama, mama, more young, more young. What did she say? Listen to her. Does it need a translation? We were talking about... No more. I think you'd better go, Mr. River. Mother! Mother, what are you doing? Pong pong go. Take it. Take the letter, Mr. Rivera. Perhaps my mother is right. I don't know. Take it. It's written in Chinese. How am I supposed to... The letter came ten days ago from China. It says my grandmother is sick. She might die unless we send two thousand dollars. She needs medicine and surgeons... Please, get up. Go, please. Please, please. She went to her mother, took her hand. They turned their backs on me and moved to a place where a candle burned against carved brass. I was an intruder. I left. I walked down the hill onto Grant Street. Fog was gone now, and the Chinatown neon lighted up the tourists and the brocade and the carved ivory. I thought about Mrs. Shen. The word she'd used was shame to explain why a son of hers had taken his own life. Then about the letter from China, then the two $1,000 bills, and Johnny Shen's defiance. But mostly the letter from China. I felt I hadn't got a story at all, but only incidents, and the story was still going on even while I was thinking about it. Next morning, I checked with Abe Melenkoff. Now, on the Shen story we had this morning, we need a good, strong follow. It's not cleaned up by any means. What have you got? Here. I'm waiting for you to come in to show it to you. Financial gave it to me a little while ago. Chinatown Bank reports minor run. A period of 60 days, over $2 million. Withdrawals from 500 to two, 3,000. What do you think? I'd say Johnny Shen had company. You take pencil and paper, you can figure he had practically all of Chinatown for company. How come all those people need all that money all at once? That's a good question. I got another one. Why? wonder if it's happening in other Chinatowns. I'll call down L.A., talk to Cassell, ask him. I'll have it put on the Times wire, find out what's going on in New York. West Falls in Baltimore, he can check out Chinatown there. I've got a reading on Chicago and Boston and Philly. Starts with a street corner fight and we call all over the country. If this keeps rolling, it can be quite a thing. Already is, her mother's been told her son's dead. kind of November day that happens sometimes in San Francisco. Sunlit city and strands of cloud. November winds and freighters from the tropics tied up at the Embarcadero. Ten o'clock of a November day and pick up the home edition of the Chronicle. Crease it lengthwise and consider headline first as concerns a Senate investigating committee. And then the current communique about the current war. And spliced between the two of them, the death of Lee Shen. Continued on page six. Now more legwork to be done. On Stockton Street in Chinatown, number 5143, house of the Chinese Community Service Union. Overlords of local Chinese affairs. All powerful, all discreet, all knowing. Tin Young saw me come into the office, looked at me for a minute, then beckoned me over. I'm fairly busy, Mike. You come at not a very good time. I want to talk to you, Mr. Young. Not that I mind, for surely you must have a reason. I have, Lee Shen. That's not a reason. The way he died and why he died. You already know that. We wrote what his sister told me. Lee killed himself out of shame. We wrote it, but didn't understand it. And for that, you've come to the Chinese Service Union? Because you don't understand the word shame? Because the Chinese Service Union runs Chinatown and its people and everything in it. If you want to know anything, that's where you go. I'll state it for you, Mike, gladly. Li Shen jumped out of the window because Johnny Shen wouldn't give him grandmother money. It's a type of culture. Then you know about the letter the Shen family got from China. Mike, Mike. And the run your people made on the bank here in Chinatown. You know about that, too. Why? Why are they doing it? 
My God. Why, are there other letters from China saying somebody's grandmother is sick and please send a couple of thousand dollars to make a will? Is that what's happening? Listen to or me. Or maybe if I put it this way, blackmail. Blackmail I'm on a scale that... I'm trying to tell you something. Well, go ahead. Give me the official statement of the Chinese service union. I'll listen, I'll write it, and... This you will not write. What you're saying I'm is... I'm saying this is our statement... It concerns no one. Except the people in this community, except the boy except who... Except the boy who is dead because of the letter. Official statement as to you. What I've been trying to say to you. Don't make more people die. I left. Follow-up now. I walked down to Grand Avenue to the 900 block. The Chinatown branch of the Bank of America said they'd cooperate and furnish me with a list of the people who'd made sizable withdrawals during the bank run. I started to check it out. Alka Chuen, 412 Jason Street. And be told that Mr. Chuen was away on a business trip, couldn't be reached. Then two doors down, Tom Shu, too busy to talk to anyone now. Next, around the corner to see Yu Ching, 108 Spofford Street, and the child on the sidewalk said no one was at home. And it went like that. It was mid-afternoon when I walked into Sam Shank's curio shop. I can help you, mister. I'm looking for Sam Shang. I am Sam Shang. We're looking for some nice china bells? No, thanks. I just want to talk to you, Mr. Shang. I'm from the Chronicle. Oh. You want good Chinatown story? You will mention the shop of Sam Shang? Sure, sure I will. Thank you. Many stories of Chinatown. Many, many. Did you know Lee Shen? Johnny Shen? Mr. Shang, there's something else I want to ask you. It's personal. Maybe I have no right. I cannot know until you ask. A couple of weeks ago, you withdrew $1,200 from the bank. A lot of other people took their savings out, too. My paper wants to know why. You have talked with these other people? I've tried. So far, I haven't been able to... And you ask this personal question of Sam Shang? Mm Mm-hmm. But only because something's happening here that we don't understand... Why a boy killed himself after his brother beat him up. Why so many of you... Also, you have talked with the Chinese service union. Yes, I have. And they told you... What did they tell you? I could tell you they said for you to talk to me. But you will tell me what they truly said. That it was none of my concern. That Li Shen was dead because of a letter from China. That others might die. Including you? I got that impression. If it is the wisdom of the Chinese service union... Yeah, Yeah, wisdom. Your people being bled of every dime, of every dignity, they... Thanks, Mr. Shank. Wait. Yeah. I had such a letter two weeks ago. Such a letter as was received by Mrs. Shen, the mother of Lee. Go on. It was from my sister... From Canton, my sister said she was very sick of a disease of the eyes, that she needed what monies I... I sent her $1,200. Why have you... Three days ago, I have received another letter from Canton. It wrote of something I did not know. What? My sister has been dead for a year. It was late afternoon when the story began to shape itself. Just about the time the first edition was being trucked down the peninsula, there was a phone call from Cassell in Los Angeles. Maybe it's nothing at all, Mike. What have you got? Just yesterday, a suicide. A Chinese named Ho Liang swallowed poison and died quietly in a restroom at Union Station. Why'd he do it? I guess as good as mine, but this is the first suicide down here in Chinatown in 23 years. Well, anything on why he killed himself? No suicide, not if that's what you mean. Mm Mm-hmm. But there was a letter on him. From China? That's right, from Swat Tao, asking for $500. Who would die unless the money was sent? His uncle from cancer, letter said. How'd you know about it? We get mail here, too. Thanks a lot. Hey. Yeah? What's it all about? I don't know yet. No, I'm not writing for the papers anymore, Mike. What's it all about? It's about blackmail. Blackmail all the way from China? Not China. Red China. The next day was Wednesday, and the third item on the New York Times teletype told of a small run on the Mott Street Bank, the one most patronized by Chinatown. And later, a similar item from Chicago. 
Nothing from Boston, but in the afternoon there was a phone call from Baltimore. A man named John Tu Kuo had robbed a supermarket of over $500, the first Chinese involved in a felony in Baltimore for over five years. Tu Kuo gave himself up three hours later, but refused to say what he had done with the money. The pattern was clear. I went back to Mr. Young of the Chinese Service Union. Tea? No, thanks. You won't mind if I do. Mm. Mr. Young. The tea isn't very good. Listen, No, I... you listen, Mike. I enjoy making comments, so indulge me. The tea isn't very good. I'm sorry. That's better. The pleasantries have been taken care of. Now you can talk to me. These last two days... He's been knocking on doors and asking questions and getting no answers. Not quite. Getting answers. Some. Not very good, you understand, but not bad. I can remember... You want to hear some of the answers? You're being rude again. Oh, let's get off it now, Mr. Young. I'll stop bowing my head and you stop being so colorful. It is time for that, isn't it? I would say so. Tell me what you know. There was a run on the Chinatown Bank here in San Francisco. There was one in New York and Chicago. In Boston, too. We got no word from there. It probably wasn't noticed. It's not a very big colony. In Baltimore, a man named Tu Kuo committed grand theft. He sent the money to China and ended his life by going to jail. True. I've heard. Down the street, Sam Shang got an anguished letter two weeks ago, supposedly from his sister in China, except she's been dead for over a year. Also true. And where it all started, as far as I'm concerned, the Shen family. Lee killed himself because his brother wouldn't let him send money to China. He died because he believed he was forsaking his grandmother. What do you want from us? All over every Chinatown in the country, people are getting letters from China. I asked you, what do you want from us? Tell me I'm not just guessing. About what? Your people are being blackmailed by Red China, is that it? Communist China, Soviet China, the money you send gives the enemy comfort. You're an American, Mr. Young. As much as you. Then... An American as much as you. Believe it and try to understand what I'm going to tell you. We Americans here have ties to an old country, ties of blood and tradition. Because America is what it is, the end of a search, it has roots all over the world. The roots of us... Here are in China. Yes. How does a man forsake his own? How does a man forsake his sister, his grandmother, his father? How do you turn your back on your own blood's anguish? Listen, there's a proverb. Fire burns worse than it burns your own flesh. I... Listen to me. They have come to us with this burden. What shall we do, they ask. We must send the money, they say, or this one will die or that one. What shall we do, they ask. Give us time, we say to them, and we will think of something. But we must send money, they say, or they will be dying. So we tell them to send the money. And when will it end? Now. These papers contain names and addresses. Families here in Chinatown who have gotten letters and who have paid ransom. The blackmail is more than two million dollars, Mike. It's this list and any help we can give you, ask it of us. Thanks. Now permit me a question. What will happen now? The story will be printed, it'll be read, and the world will know about it. How the communists hold their people hostage and demand ransom from America. That's the story. But now it'll be in the papers and out in the open. That's right. And the ransom will stop. Take it out of darkness, and evil dies. You're just kind of proverb. This has been a true story from the pages of the San Francisco Chronicle. In a moment, the stories follow up. The story was headlined Red China Ransom and run on the front page. The wires picked it up and printed it all over the world. The government invoked the law that made it a crime to send money to communist China under the Trading with the Enemy Act. Before it was over, more than $5 million had been extorted. But the story broke it. San Francisco Final stars Jeff Chandler as Mike Rivera. It is written and directed by David Friedkin and Morton Fine and produced by Michael Meshikoff. Music is composed and conducted by Walter Schumann and arranged by Nathan Scott. 
Heard in the cast were Harry Bartell, Jerry Hausner, Olin Soule, Lillian Bioff, Virginia Gregg, Herb Butterfield, Vic Perrin, Barney Phillips, and Tony Barrett. The engineer was Raoul Murphy, with sound by Bud Tollefson and Wayne Kendall. Welcome back. Now, this was a radio tour de force with just so many great radio veterans in there. And that ending, I thought, was just incredibly uh, moving. It was an incredible story. And I can't help but thinking if this show had been made, say, uh, four or five years earlier, it would have lasted a season or two. This was just top-notch work. Uh, the dragnet feel, you defi- I definitely felt it. Um, so many people were involved in this, including Walter Schumann, who uh, did the music for Dragnet in San Francisco Final, as well as a lot of the actors. And Jeff Chandler uh, was actually uh, good friends with uh, Jack Webb as well. And the two uh, worked together with Webb doing guest work on the uh, new adventures of uh, Michael Shane. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this uh, episode, our 250th uh, episode special. We'll be back on... Monday with Box 13. Uh, In the meantime, send your comments to Box 13 at GreatDetectives.net. Follow the show on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And give us a call by voicemail, 208-991-4783. From Boise, Idaho, though, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.